Hello everyone. Welcome to the case solving and guesstimate session conducted by 180 Degrees Consulting SRCC. Before we dive into what guesstimates are and what case solving is, let's talk a little about what is consulting. Okay, so let's start with an example. So when you fall sick, the most normal thing you would do is to visit a doctor. You consult a doctor on what your issue might be or what problem you might be facing. The doctor will then diagnose the disease that you have or the problem that you have and then will propose a solution or prescribe medication. Similarly, in consulting as well, when a firm quote unquote falls sick, which means that there is an issue in the processes, it could be sales, marketing, operations, finance, or any other vertical in a business. When any of these verticals are facing an issue, a company would turn to a consultant for their expert advice. A consultant therefore is somebody who has specialized expertise in various areas and then provides this expertise to enterprises in different domains, which could be anything from marketing, research, financial planning, branding, HR, or anything under the sun that a business deals with. Now you have to understand that a consultant follows a very structured approach. The first step is to understand the problem and create a hypothesis. A consultant must go into the depth of the problem that the company is facing and really try to understand where it is stemming from and why it is stemming. Secondly, the, uh, the next step for any consultant is to gather input and data about the problem and about the process of the business. This input and data could be qualitative or quantitative in nature and could give insights about the trends that can be observed in the company. Furthermore, the third step is analyzing this data and understanding the trends that can be observed and understanding what sort of solutions can be feasible in this situation. This is where the consultant also does a lot of brainstorming to understand what solution is the best possible for the particular company at hand. Next step is assisting the company with the implementation of the recommendations that a consultant has given. So once the analysis is done and the recommendations have been given to the company, the job of a consultant doesn't stop there. It continues till the recommendations have been implemented by the company to judge the feasibility of these particular recommendations. Furthermore, the last step now is to communicate the results. So a consultant must have planned for the recommendations to pan out in a certain way. But at the implementation stage, things can turn out differently. So the job of a consultant is also to ensure that the solutions are implemented well and furthermore, to communicate the results and to communicate any de uh, deviations from what had been planned and what was actually implemented. Next slide, please. Okay, so... The approach to cases is also divided into three steps that we will be delving into in elaboration later. The first step is analysis. So really understanding what the problem is, where it is stemming from and why it is happening, along with gathering the input and data is where the analysis part comes in. So you have to really observe the data that has been provided to you and try and understand why the problem is happening and how it can be solved. Coming to the solution, is the ideation and implementation stage. This is again a core brainstorming stage where you have to apply all the knowledge you have to the given problem to think of the multiple ways a problem can be solved. The third is communicating your solutions to the client via a presentation. Now a presentation must be professional so as to ensure that the client is understanding the solutions extremely clearly and it must also be aesthetic for the same reason that the, it'll become easier for the client to understand your recommendations. Now, Aman will be taking over. Okay, guys. So as you have now learned the brief approach to the cases, and this approach can not only be used for, uh, I mean, the cases that are there for competitions, but also for analyzing any business-related issue or situation. Now, per se, uh, we'll start with each and every step and understand them in detail. The first step that we learned is analyzing a case. So first uh, step in this particular step is to understand what type of case it is. There are n number of cases that can be there. There can be a market entry case, an outreach case, a fundraising case, and so on and so forth. So first you have to understand what cases it is. 
so as to proceed in a rational and logical manner. After that, don't just go into the nitty gritties of the case and start reading it from the starting. First, read the overview and the case questions that are generally there on the first and the last page. This is a general uh, convention that is followed, but you may in some cases find the case questions on the first page, but you get the general idea that first you have to read the overview and the case questions. After you have done this, you go to reading the entire case thoroughly, including the data and the footnotes. The case setters sometimes give you uh, many graphs, tables and footnotes. Uh, so don't ignore them. Read them because th uh, they are the touch points where the case setter wants to drive you to. So don't just simply ignore them. Use them in your analysis. Fourth step is breaking of the problem. Now, as you have uh, read the case thoroughly, you should break down the broad problems that are given in the case question into some small sub problems so that they can be easily researched upon and can be measurably solved. The last step uh, is that while analyzing the problems, you can use frameworks and various strategies that we'll be talking about in the session later. And these frameworks are particularly for you to understand the problem in detail. Now, moving on, we'll be looking at the ideation and the implementation part. Next slide, please. So the second step that comes here is ideation and implementation. To start with it, you have to do an, a thorough research and brainstorming about the problems that you have identified and the sub problems, mainly the sub problems that you have identified. You have to find a solution for each of these problems. For that, you have to, and for the entire case, you have to give two to three concrete ideas or solutions. Don't put forward 10 options to the client because that is not what you are here for. You are here for to give one best solution to the client. So brainstorm and filter out two to three best ideas that you feel that are very concrete and can solve the problem in a tangible manner. So that is what we say. Go for depth rather than width. Second is content planning. After you have uh, known that these are the solutions that you will be presenting, you have to plan it on various slides. You have to understand that how it will go on the slide, how the data would be presented on the slide. Although this uh, overlaps a little with the presentation part, but here mainly you decide basically that what you will be showing on each slide. Now, segmentation of the problem. As we have uh, discussed earlier also, you have to segment the problem into sub parts and that is how you show it on the slides or two. Before writing anything on the slide, synthesize it properly and give a full context so that it is easily understandable. There should be a story forming out from your slideshow. There should not be half a dozen slides put one after the another. Each should be interlinked one after the other. The final step is exploring. For exploring, you can use various sources that are available on the internet. That is statista.com or you can use World Bank. There are various government sites that have a lot of data. So the idea over here is that all the answers or all the solutions that you give should be data backed. And that is what we call data back insights. So any relevant information that is necessary to back your information should be there, be it data or be it any sort of research. Now we move forward to the third and the last step of presentation. Now for presentation, we do not have a step-by-step -step approach that should be followed. But while creating and presenting to the client, you should keep in mind certain things that must accompany your presentation. First is an overview of the company that you are giving uh, your services to. Although the company owner knows his company very well, but still you have to tell them that where they stand in respect to the competitive landscape that is existing. Second is problem identification. So as we have discussed in uh, earlier steps also, you identify and divide the problem. You have to put that in your slide that these are the problems that you can identify from what the inputs you receive from the client. After that, solution breakdown. So as you broke your problem down, you should also break down your solution. So there should not be a huge chunk of data on one side, uh, giving the solution of the entire case, one or two slides. The solution should be broken into various subsections and each section should be presented on a separate slide in a nice manner. After that, a proper summary or what we call an executive summary should be given at the starting of the slideshow. An executive summary gives the client a very quick pace from your to, to your presentation. There you show just the key problems that you are that you have identified and the recommendations that you are giving. 
Last is annexure. So as we talked about data packs inside, you should you would be looking for a lot of graphs, tables, and all. But the main slideshow is not a place where you can dump all your data. On the main slide, you slides you just have to show the insights that you're drawing from the data and the key figures that are there. All the rest of the research or the supporting material and the data will go in annexures. Now we will look at uh, certain general tips and recommendations. So next slide, please. So we uh, here are certain general tips or recommendations that you should follow while uh, throughout the entire process. And these are common to all the three steps that we discussed here. Firstly, use infographics instead of pictures. That looks more professional and it makes your PPT look better. Don't overdo the graphics. Keep them simplistic and minimalistic yet appealing. Then the length of the solution. Keep your solution as comprehensive as possible within the slide limit. Exhaust your slide limit. That is, if you have received a slide limit of set 10, then use the entire 10 slides to present your analysis. Third is uniqueness of the slides. As, you, as we have moved you through this presentation also, you would have noticed that there was not even a single slide that was repeated in terms of design. And yet you felt the consistency in the design in terms of color scheme and in terms of the general appeal of the slideshow. So this is what you have to do. Your slide should be as unique as possible and also consistent in nature. Although you can repeat certain graphics, but try to avoid it uh, for like for certain things it is required. So if you are creating breaker slides, then all of them should be of the same design. But uh, within the content, you can have a uniqueness in design. Now avoid predefined frameworks. So as we discussed in the first case, the frameworks can only be used to understand the problem well. Don't use them in your solutions because they make the solutions very rigid and the client is looking for customized solution for the problems that they have put forward. Last is professionalism. Maintain professionalism while presenting, speaking and also in your slideshow. Don't use very bright and dominant colors in excess. They are just to give a touch to your slideshow. Keep, your, keep them very formal and official and use, a, use the same color scheme throughout your presentation. Now we will move on and uh, Ananya will take over. Right. So moving on to consulting frameworks. When a car breaks down, we require tools to deal with the mechanical problem. Similarly, a business problem requires consulting tools or frameworks to be understood in a comprehensive manner. Frameworks are tools that managers can use to perform key tasks in an efficient manner. Frameworks remain important as concepts to answer case studies to break down business problems. Any approach to solve a business problem can incorporate a new framework. However, there are certain conventional consulting frameworks. We do not advise a rigid use of a specific framework. The main purpose of learning them is to help structure our answers. Moving on to the SWOT analysis. Next slide, please. SWOT analysis is the most basic and essential framework used to evaluate a company's competitive position to develop strategic planning. SWOT analysis assesses internal and external factors as well as current and future, future potential of the company. Talking about internal factors, they include manufacturing capabilities, personal and finance. Naming a few external factors, they include socio-cultural changes, macro level factors, etc. SWOT helps in framing an effective strategy that capitalizes on the opportunities through the use of strengths and neutralizes the threats by minimizing the impact of weakness. Moving on to the next framework. Right. So pestle analysis is something most of you would have studied in class 12th. Uh, before we move on to the details, it is important to understand the factors that can affect any organization. Starting with the internal factors, Everything within the company over which the company has direct control is included in the internal factors. These may include structure, culture, employees, reward systems, etc. For example, for Apple, the way they design their mobiles is an internal factor. Uh, external factors can be divided into the task environment and macro environment. Task environment include all those factors that are external to the firm but have a direct and specific impact and are in turn affected by the organization's operations. These include competitors, customers, suppliers, etc. Example, for Apple, the way Samsung is designing its mobiles is a factor of the task environment. 
macro environment, everything over which the company has absolutely no control. They hence have a one-way effect on the company. This is where the pestle framework comes in. Uh, for example, for Apple, government regulations on the import of mobile phones is an external factor. Next slide, please. So PESTEL is a strategic framework used to evaluate the external environment of a business by breaking down opportunities and threats into the following. P is for political factors like political stability and trade restrictions. E is for economic factors like interest rates, inflation, and unemployment. S is for social factors like demographic trends, population growth, and health cautiousness. T is for technological factors like R&D activity, automation, and technological incentives. L is for legal factors like licenses, permits, and labor laws. And finally, E is for environmental factors like climate change and pollution. Moving on to the next framework. Maisie. Maisie is a principle used by consulting firms to describe a way of organizing information. This is not so much of a framework or a structure, but rather it is more of a way of thinking. The Maisie principle suggests that to understand and fix any large problems, you need to first sort them into two main categories. The first category being mutually exclusive, which means items can fit into one category at a time. The second category being collectively exhaustive, meaning all items can fit into one of the categories. Let's look at an example to understand this better. Next slide, please. Let's divide people into two main groups below and equal to 60 years and above 60 years, and the second one being 30 to 70 years and above 60 years. Which one of these do you think is Macy? Let's look at the first category, below and equal to 60 years and above 60. Is it mutually exclusive? Yes. Is it collectively exhaustive? Yes. This is because there is a clear distinction between the two categories and there is no overlap. However, if you consider the second group, clearly it is not Macy above 60 years falls within the first category and there is an overlap. Hence, it is not Macy. These are some of the basic frameworks used by consulting firms. You can make use of the application of these frameworks in case battles and case competitions. Moving on to guesstimates. So uh, now let's start with one of the most popular and exciting topic of consulting, which is uh, asked during interviews, guesstimates. So guesstimates play a very important part in any consulting or analytic interview. It, it gives an interviewer a peek into your problem solving and thinking abilities. The focus is more on the approach rather than getting the answer right. So what is guesstimate? So as the name suggests, it's an estimate based on a mixture of guesswork and calculation. The process of problem solving is fairly simple. We look at various parameters that might affect the given problem and we arrive at an estimated quantity. Uh, for example, if an interviewer asks you, uh, how many cappuccino does Starbucks sell in a day? So he most definitely doesn't look for the exact number. What he wants is the approach that the interviewee has used to get that final number. I know this sounds a little bit complicated, but will help you understand this via an example. However, before we begin, it is important to set out the guiding pathway on how to approach them. As stated in the slide, the approach comprises of a five-step process, which, uh, which includes clarifying the uh, problem. Uh, number two, identifying the problem. Number three, applying the approach followed by estimating and lastly, checking and verifying the final value. Let's discuss these steps in a better way. Uh, step number one, clarifying the problem. So we have to try and extract the exact information from the interviewer uh, on what he wants us to calculate. We uh, do this by asking a number of preliminary questions and so that we we, we uh, are on the same page as the interviewer. We always ask first before we attempt any guesstimate. Step number two, identifying the problem. There is no foolproof way to approach a guesstimate. You can solve a guesstimate using several approaches. 
you have to break down the problem into smaller pieces and if you want to minimize calculation and guesswork involved. Step number three, applying the approach. Once you have devised the approach, it is time to decide which approach you want to use. You should always look for various filters uh, which you can use in a particular guesstimate such as age-wise filter, gender-wise filter, region-wise filter, etc. Step number four, estimating. This is one of the trickiest steps in guesstimate. You have to come up with the suitable assumptions just justify your calculations. Use your assumptions and approach and you will estimate the final value. Uh, and the last step, which is checking the final value, you have to verify your answers and do a fact check on the same. So moving on to the next slide. So uh, as you can see, uh, there are two major frameworks which are used in guesstimates, the MISI approach and the Pareto's principle. Now, my fellow directors have already explained to you the MISI approach, and I think you guys have a good idea of what Pareto principle is. However, let me just give you a little brief of what Pareto principle is. The Pareto principle states that for, for many outcomes, roughly 80% of consequences consequences come from 20% of causes. In other words, a small percentage of causes have an outsized effect. So what does this mean? It means that, for example, 20% of a plant contain 80% of fruits. 20% of players result in 80% of the points scored. The idea behind this strategy is that we uh, are trying to split what we are calculating in terms of the majority and the minority. We calculate the majority portion first, which is followed by calculating the minority portion. Now, uh, as you can see on the right side of your screen, there's a guesstimate cheat sheet. So this cheat sheet would actually make your life much easier and it will help you solve guesstimates uh, very quickly and very easily. And uh, we would be providing you with the guesstimate cheat sheets uh, in the resources that uh, we would be mailing you. Uh, also, we uh, you can just check out our website and uh, you can find guesstimate cheat sheets and a number of guesstimates which have been handpicked by our directors and which have been completed by them. So uh, there are a number of reliable resources which you can use to uh, actually um, understand what guesstimate is which is listed down below such as the world bank report the census of india economic survey of india and we would definitely recommend to uh, you to actually go through these resources and get a fair idea of what guesstimate is now that i now believe that you have a good idea of what guesstimate is i will just uh, give you a brief of the two approach that we use while guesstimating the demand side approach and the supply side approach. The demand side approach estimates the number of end consumers and the units consumed or used by each consumer. While the supply side approach uh, focuses on the supplier side approach in the question. Now, uh, let's give you a better understanding of the approach. We'll start with a guesstimate example. Uh, hi guys. So. We, I hope you guys have a fair idea of what a guesstimate is, what is the basic ideology to solve the guesstimate. But what actually uh, adds to our knowledge is actually solving one. So what I would be doing at the moment is solving one guesstimate for you guys so that you guys know that what type of filters we apply, how we come on to the final figure, and what type of assumptions we take during the process. So the guesstimate we have over here with us is estimate the number of CCTV cameras in banks in Delhi. So the very first assumption uh, questions that the interviewee asks from the interviewer, uh, do you, are we only talking about the branches of banks or are we also considering the ATM vestibules? Let's consider in this specific scenario that the interviewer responds with the answer that we're only considering the branches. Now, it is my responsibility as an interviewee to come up with a figure for CCTV cameras. But how do I come to that figure? Let's see. First of all, uh, we are considering the population of Delhi, that is 3 crores, right? Uh, the value of 3 crores and different values during the guesstimates, you can find them in the guesstimate cheat sheet as well as 
uh, as well as you are supposed to know some of these basic figures as a consultant. So this is the very reason that we are providing a number of resources along with these guesstimate cheat sheet. So we divide the population into aspects, 80% and uh, 20% with the criteria being a majority or minority 18 plus years or 18 minus years so the th uh, the fact being uh, that a minority uh, person cannot hold a bank account without being accompanied by a ma major person and this is also taken as an assumption that we are only considering a major account holders at the moment we then divide the 80 percent population that is two crores 40 a lakh into different income levels that is high income upper middle lower middle and bpl category why is it important to divide them in different category income levels because uh mukesh ambani as a person is more likely to hold more number of bank accounts than i am holding at the moment right so this is the basic, very basic criteria for having the income criteria we divide them uh in 20 40 25 as uh, and 15 percent criteria the basic reasoning for this is uh, basic uh, the knowledge you should know as a consultant. Uh, you should be able to back these figures by some facts or uh, when the interviewer asks you, why are you taking these figures? You should be able to come up with these facts and this is where all the resources are going to help you. This is where we are going to help you in building a profile. So when we divide, when we take divide them in different income level groups, we take how much portion of population is actually having a bank account. We have taken some reasonable figures, 100%, 90%, 70%, and 50%, again, backed by reasonable facts. Uh, then the total number of uh, high-income people above 18 years comes out to be uh, 48 lakh. Similarly, uh, when we calculate this, the total number of bank accounts is coming out to be 2 crores. Now, we have calculated the total number of bank accounts. But what is the use of this? We have not arrived at CCTV cameras, right? So, let's see. From this, we are going to arrive at the average number of or uh, total number of banks there are in Delhi. We have taken the average number of bank accounts uh, in a single bank to be 5,000. And when we divide the uh, total number of banks actually come out to be 4,000. We have then divided the 4,000 banks in different categories, that is small banks, medium banks, and large banks. Uh, again, by reasonable facts, 10% for small banks, 70% for medium, and 20% for large banks. We have uh, estimated with, again, facts and figures for different types of banks, the number of CCTV cameras they will be having. Let's talk about the small banks. Uh, let's say they, they would be one on entrance for cash counters, for security, and for uh, a couple of more reasons, right? So this is the basic of the reason. This is, this is how you're supposed to explain to the interview, how are you going to back, how have you arrived at this figure? When we just club these figures uh, from different types of banks, we come on to the total value of 42,000 per CCTV camera. So this is uh, how we actually solve a guesstimate. This is a guesstimate. This is one of the examples where we have combined a slight approach of uh, demand, a slight approach of supply as explained by Lokesh earlier. There are, you can anything uh, like, uh, you can solve a guesstimate on number of masks. You can solve a guesstimate on the amount of revenue from sale of momos, uh, given a time period and a place. So this is just one of the examples. And I hope uh, the guesstimate solving has actually helped. So this is it for the case solving session, guys. Uh, hope the case solving session actually adds value uh, to you. And in case of any queries, any anything we can help you with whether related to society or college life in general we will be more than happy to take that out thank you